Welcome to week four, lecture one of HIL227, HIH227, Medieval Britain. Uh, this is where the course uh, begins to take a turn in the direction of uh, social and economic history and away from political history. So the goal over the next few lectures is to, to get a better sense of the developing nature of the society uh, which is living within these emergent nations in the British Isles and which is subject to the various uh, laws and regulations and changes that are happening across this period as discussed uh, particularly in the last two lectures. I'm thinking here of the uh, specific of the lecture on law and justice in medieval England and the extension of English systems of justice to other societies in Wales, Ireland and to some extent Scotland. <laughs> so this is quite a bit of a, a shift from what we've had before uh, and I've put quite a lot more text on the slides themselves so please do take your time, uh, you stop the slideshow if you need to, you can go back and uh, review these slides one at a time to help you revise at a later date the material in this lecture. So I'm going to start by uh, outlining the main aspects of social structures in this period. We're going to talk about land and people, the relationship between the two. Uh, we're then going to talk about family and kinship and how uh, kinship structures play into people's relationship with the land uh, and indeed with the wider world. And number three, we're going to talk about uh, ways in which the average person in medieval Britain interacted with the wider world through trade or warfare, for example. And the key reading for this lecture is really uh, Philip Schofield's volume, Peasant and Community in Medieval England, 1200 to 1500, uh, published by uh, Pelgrave in 2003. You'll find numerous copies of that in the library. It may also be available as an ebook. You'd have to give that a quick check. So to start us off, uh, land and people, <coughs> well, I put the quote here down the rabbit hole uh, as a reference to Alice in Wonderland because this really is a fundamental, uh, uh, an area of fundamental difference between the way in which modern society works and the way in which medieval society worked. The vast majority of the population until the 19th century, of course, were tenant farmers living in the countryside and in many parts of Europe, it's right up into the mid 20th century. Uh, that an awful lot of the population, well over half, uh, lived as uh, farmers on the rural landscape. Now, in a medieval context, a person's status was largely determined by the relationship between the family and the family's land. Now, this is a key vocabulary term here, tenure. Uh, this word tenure refers to that relationship between land and the land they hold. Excuse me, family and the land they hold. That tenure relationship between the family and the land uh, defines what laws you lived by, what taxes you paid, uh, indeed what services you owed. Uh, here, for example, labor services owed to the Lord. Uh, and in what courts you sought justice. Now, I'll walk you through uh, each of the three basic types of land tenure over the next, through, next uh, three slides. But just to outline them here. The basic kinds of tenure are unfree, uh, unfree land, or unfree tenure. Uh, if you have unfree land, then you are an unfree person. Uh, in fact, if you were a free person and bought unfree land, you are reclassified as unfree. What do I mean by unfree? Well, these are your, your serfs uh, in medieval Britain and Europe. They uh, hold a, a hereditary unfree status uh, that's believed by some to be uh, in their blood effectively. These are people who are bound to the land in the sense they, they can't leave the, the manor on which their farm is located without the permission of the lord of the manor. Uh, in that sense they're, they're bound to the land and sometimes called bondmen. Now, this gets a little confusing here, so I just want to recap. If you hold unfree land, then you are an unfree person. And there are at least three uh, words, all mean the same thing for our purposes. Uh, unfree, serf, or bondman. Uh, 
all three of those words, unfree, serf, and bondman, reflect uh, the fact that you hold land by quote unquote unfree tenure. <coughs> now, the second type of land tenure is leasehold land, and this is when you hold land for a term of years or for life. Now, this is uh, pretty much, I want to be careful here, but it's more or less unchanged from the concept of holding something at lease now. For example, uh, a student uh, hiring a flat for the course of an academic year probably holds that flat uh, by lease, which means that for the duration of the lease, you have certain rights. You can't be, you know, you can't be told that you have to leave. You can't be displaced from the property. But at the same time, at the end of the lease, you're bound to return the property to its owner and you have no uh, long term rights in it. In a way, leasehold for people trying to improve their condition in the Middle Ages could be a halfway house between unfree tenure uh, and freehold tenure. And I'll elaborate on that uh, in just a moment. Now, freehold tenure uh, is when you hold land uh, directly or indirectly of the king for a cash rent. So freehold land is the thing that most closely approximates uh, what we today would call property ownership. So you have the property, uh, as long as you keep paying your taxes on that property, you cannot legally or lawfully be displaced from it. You also have the right to sell that property or to pass it on uh, through a will uh, to designated heirs. Now it's also worth noting that uh, uh, back in 1066, the time of the Norman conquest of England, about 10% of the population was comprised of slaves still. Slavery had been very common uh, across the British Isles in the 7th, 8th, 9th century. And it's still there in 1066, although it would very quickly disappear uh, over the following century or so. Uh, keep in mind that this is slavery uh, not dictated uh, by the color of one's skin. So that's to say it's not the type of slavery that you would have in the 16, 17, 1800s, but rather it's the slavery imposed upon people who are defeated in warfare. So if we were in medieval Ireland, for example, uh, and one group, uh, uh, one family group or larger tribal grouping or minor Irish kingdom should conduct warfare against another and uh, defeat those persons to take prisoners, they might keep some of them as slaves. Slavery uh, is, in that sense, something which is a almost kind of POW status, uh, but it can be quite it can be quite demeaning. And of course, there are complaints uh, as late as the 13th century in the north of England uh, about people banding, particularly complaints about young men uh, banding together to purchase a female slave uh, for sexual exploitation. So dreadful, really. Uh, but more or less, slavery is dead by 1200. So I'm going to sidestep the slavery issue for the rest of this lecture, and we'll talk about these three types of uh, land tenure next. Unfree land, leasehold land, freehold land. <coughs> so what does unfree tenure say about you? Well, in the Dark Ages, powerful landlords and later Norman conquerors it coerced people into a relationship where tenants uh, farmed their own lands, plus did a day or to a week uh, farming the Lord's land. Now, this is almost like a kind of protection racket. So imagine here, uh, you know, a kind of mafia type scenario where, where people come into your shop with some, if you're a shopkeeper, people might come into your shops with a, a, a club and say, we're going to bust up the shop unless you pay us some uh, protection money to leave you alone. By the way, as long as we're uh, extending your protection, we will fight off any rival mafia groupings that want to coerce you in a similar way. Now, that's really the, the nature of the establishment of unfree status uh, throughout uh, Northern and Western Europe in the Middle Ages. It's, it's about powerful, uh, particularly in, in uh, England, it's about powerful Norman conquerors coming in and really coercing people into a a strong landlord-tenant relationship where the tenants down at the bottom uh, become kind of unfree persons in the, quote, protection of the Lord, uh, but at the same time 
uh, they have to do some labour service for the Lord. Now, not everyone uh, in medieval Britain finds himself uh, shunted into this position in the Dark Ages or after the Norman Conquest. Some people manage to resist that, uh, resist the establishment of that course of relationship, and they're the persons who would be uh, of free status. We'll come back to them in a slide or so. Now, uh, under unfree tenure, there is a, a peasant landlord bond, and there is a peasant land bond. Uh, the peasant is is uh, bound to the land in the sense that uh, uh, a bondman's property passes uh, from generation to generation, uh, together with bond status, down uh, down through his family, and neither can the uh, child of a bondman consider himself free, nor can the child of a bondman consider himself free to move off of the farm. They're connected to it. You know, it's this really powerful bond. The landlord, on the other hand, uh, can't turf bondmen off the manor completely. Landlords, it's established uh, as common law develops in the 1200s, could take a bond family and say, farm these 50 acres over there rather than this 50 acres over here, but they couldn't turf them off the manor completely. But neither would they want to because it's these bond peasants who spend some of their time uh, farming some land uh, that the Lord has retained as his own private property. The law in medieval Britain is elaborated uh, rapidly across the 1100s <coughs> in particular, and by 1200 there are various restrictions placed on bond persons uh, that effectively make them chattels of, prop uh, of property. So they're not slaves, they can't be forced to do any old thing, you know, the, what the Lord demands of them is carefully regulated by custom, but at the same time because they're attached to the land, because they can't leave the land without the Lord's permission, they become a kind of value-added aspect of the land. So if one uh, medieval knight should sell his estates to a different medieval knight, effectively uh, the value of the estates being bought and sold uh, is increased if there are lots of unfree tenants there already working the land. Bondmen, as I mentioned, need permission to leave the land uh, they could be hunted down uh, and punished if they don't return uh, after they've been given dispensation to be away for a day or two. They not only do their own uh, farming, they do labor service by which they farm the uh, Lord's land and they also pay various fines such as the uh, a marriage fine to get married, uh, a fine called Learite, which is a, a fine for uh, fornication, that is to say, uh, for having sex outside of wedlock. They pay a fine called Child White if they have children outside of wedlock. Uh, there's a fine called a Harriet, which is a effectively a inheritance tax, where you give the upon the death of the owner of a farm, the best of the best animal from the farm is given to the Lord, and there are many more of these customary fines. Uh, these unfree tenants or bondmen, uh, they really have a hard time of it in the Middle Ages, and as we get into the 1200s, particularly the late 1200s, lords work hard to ramp up where they can, uh, to ramp up what they're squeezing out of these tenants in terms of fines and duties. <coughs> Now, if you're an unfree person and you want to seek justice, uh, you can seek justice against another unfree person in your manor court. Uh, and on a manor, uh, this is a gathering which happens, the manor court's a gathering which happens typically once a month or so, where all of the adult male heads of household turn up at an appointed place and they decide disputes between uh, various tenants in the manor uh, based on the so-called custom of the manor. And the Lord is the uh, chair of this court, and he is also the ultimate judge if the uh, persons in attendance on a day can't decide what ought to be done in a certain circumstance. Bondmen, had a excuse me, bondmen did not have access to the common law, that is to say, uh, 
the king's official law courts, uh, nor could they challenge the lord of the manor uh, in any lawsuit. If a bondman were to go to a king's court, say a, a county court, and try and sue the lord of the manor, all that all the uh, lord would have to do is turn up and say, this man is my unfree tenant, he is my serf, and the case would immediately be thrown out of court. Uh, bondmen could actually be subject to corporal punishment by the lord in extreme circumstances. For example, if they failed to turn up and do that one day a week or two days a week of unpaid labor required of them by the lord. Bond status is almost con considered a contagion. If a, if a bondman buys free land, then the land is reclassified as bond land and anyone who should own it for all time will uh, have to assume bond status. If a free person marries a bond person, they're demoted to bond status. Uh, and another important aspect here is the communal nature of the, uh, the society of bond people in the village. Often the unfree of a village had a collective responsibility, not only for farming local bond lands, but also for paying certain taxes to the Lord. Uh, the idea here is that more people reduces indivi reduce individual workload. Uh, and so the Lord was always trying to expand his cohort of uh, expand his cohort of unfree people because it meant he was more sure to collect all of his fines, fees, and taxes, particularly of their communal level fines, pay fines paid by the group. Of course, on the other side, uh, it means that if the bond population of a village drops dramatically uh, because the taxes at a village level tend to be fixed, it means the individual tax burden goes up. Uh, now this would really come to, to pinch, for example, after the Black Death, when at the first outbreak, 30 or 40 percent of people die, that means that your individual tax burden uh, goes up proportionally. Keep in mind that around about 1200, as much as 80% of the population in some parts of England was comprised of bond persons, particularly in Champion England, as it was called, the Broadsway, the best lowland uh, farmland stretching from uh, Devon in the southwest diagonally across to uh, County Durham in the northeast. So the best uh, arable farmland tended to have the most unfree tenants. Now the second type of, of uh, tenure is leasehold tenure. When you have a, a land by lease, you hold it of the Lord for, or king uh, for a set term of years, or you can have a lease for life. It's held in exchange for cash rent. Terms are negotiated in relation to prevailing economic conditions. And so if you think that uh, uh, you want to lease some property and you expect that property uh, rents will go up, in the long term, then what you want to do is pin the Lord down on a fixed lease rate uh, for maybe the next uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years. But if you think that uh, the, the tax rate is going to go down progressively over the next 10 years, then you're probably going to opt for quite a short lease, maybe of only a year or two, hoping to renegotiate and get a better deal down the road. So you have some, some kind of uh, capacity with a lease <coughs> to determine your own uh, financial future, certainly more so than a bond person had. Both unfree and free tenants could like, take leasehold land. So an unfree bond person could top up what they possess by leasing some land uh, in the same way that a, a a free tenant could top up what they had by leasing some land without the uh, excuse me without the concern on behalf of a free tenant that having uh, that land would change his tenorial status it can be a kind of a, a halfway house between bond and free in fact after the black death uh, when bond tenants are really struggling under the yoke of village tax duties that they can't pay because half of the villagers have died. What you see is they go to the Lord and desperately try to uh, upgrade 
from being a bond tenant to a leasehold tenant uh, at a better uh, a better rent rate. If you're a freehold tenant, uh, freehold is the last form of tenure. A freehold tenant holds land directly or indirectly, the king, uh, for a fixed rent. So when they buy the property, it will be right on the property deed, uh, you know, sort of um, top pence per acre forever. Uh, you have a right to leave your property to your heirs in a will uh, as you see fit. In the absence of a will, it will pass to your uh, typically to your eldest son, but in some parts of England it will be divided between your children. You could freely buy or sell your land. You may not be ejected from your land. And if a lord tries to uh, remove a free tenant from his property, that free tenant can access the common law. They can go to the county court. They can sue their lord and they can win. And then the sheriff of the county court should enforce the judgment. Now, that in itself is of tremendous importance. <clears throat> Think about your bond tenant who might feel oppressed by a new tax uh, imagined up by the lord of his manor. He can't uh, in any way sue the lord of the manor saying that that's unjust. If your bond tenant and the lord of the manor forces you to move from these good fields over here to those uh, you know, unproductive fields over there, you can't do a darn thing about it. You can't sue them in court, it'd just be thrown out. But if you're a freehold tenant, you can defend your property rights at law. And you can also defend the right to not be taxed unduly. You can defend your right uh, to live in peace without uh, being subject to any kind of corporal punishment. You're just in a much better uh, relationship. And again, if you hold freehold land unchallenged, then you're considered to be a free tenant. If you hold any bond land, if you can be shown to hold any land by bond tenure whatsoever, then you are classified as a bond tenant. So it's it's all about your tenure. You want to be very careful of the type of land you take up on in the Middle Ages. <coughs> now in, 12 t in 1250, most tenants held most or all of their land as either unfree on land or free holdings. Either unfree or free tenants could lease land uh, in a, that kind of middle ground tenure. Unfree status slowly disappears from 1250 to 1400, uh, replaced by manumitted bondmen uh, regranted their lands by leasehold tenure. This is because population is growing, labor is cheap, and lords prefer leasehold tenants paying cash uh, over unfree tenants doing labor services. This is because if you've got a, a dozen unfree tenants who are obliged to spend one day a week working on your farm, they're not going to go very fast, are they? They're unmotivated. They're, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're going to slow walk all of the labor and jobs they have to do. It's just not an efficient way of doing things. And uh, lords realize that both unfree tenants don't like having to do those labor services, and the long-term trajectory in the 1200s appears to be uh, of farm labor's wages going down. It seems better at that point to say to your unfree tenants, I tell you what, you give me uh, you know, a shilling a year, and we'll forget all about those labor services, and then I'll use that shilling a year to hire cheap laborers who, in fact, uh, will work harder, work faster, and I will have enough money to pay them to do <coughs> more days service than you would have provided anyway. So this leads to the kind of progressive disappearance uh, of some of unfree tenure in some manners. Now, unfree uh, or bond tenants. Uh, are found everywhere in the British Isles, <laughs> but around about 1250 in England, uh, their most common, uh, excuse me, in England, they're most common in the southwest, excluding Cornwall, in the Midlands, and in the northeast. Uh, however, in other areas, uh, unfree tenure is quite uncommon. For example, in Kent, only about a tw only about 25% of people are unfree. <coughs> 
In Scotland, the unfree are most common in the southern lowlands. That's, that's it's kind of belt, belt stretching westward from Edinburgh. Uh, but they comprise less than 33% of people even there. Uh, Highland peoples tend to be free. Uh, in Wales and Ireland, uh, unfreedom is, is, again, reasonably uncommon. It's only really there in uh, lowland areas that are well suited to growing grain. But of course, in Wales and Ireland, uh, such areas are far less common than they are in central England. And in, in fact, it's in those parts of Wales and Ireland that saw the greatest English immigration that you see the most unfree tenure. Uh, because effectively, when unfree persons were brought from England to Wales or Ireland, when they arrived uh, in their new uh, homes, they were told, well, you're still an unfree person. Note well, variation is really common, uh, even in Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. In certain areas, there was a high proportion of unfree. Unfree status was not a concept introduced to Scotland, Wales, and Ireland by the English. Uh, those societies had unfree tenure, it just was less common than it was in England. And where the English turn up, they tend to increase the proportion of people who are unfree uh, in colonial areas, at least at first. <coughs> now, the population of the British Isles trebles from 1066 to 1300. This is a, a really key point that you need to keep in mind for the rest of this course. Ideally, a peasant family farmed uh, what was called a virgate, uh, which is an area of land about 30 or 40 areas. Uh, if you're here at Swansea University, the large uh, uh, green between the uh, seafront road and the university buildings is about one acre as a point of reference. Now, due to population growth, uh, by 1300, the average uh, family, whether they be bond or free, only held about 10 acres. So between 1066 and 1300, the population grows dramatically and the amount of land held by a typical family uh, decreases rapidly. Now, this average holding size of 10 acres is a real problem because a family of four required about 12 acres of farmland just to avoid starvation, forget having any uh, surplus crops to take the market and sell. In unfree or bond communities in particular, land was farmed in open fields. Fields were divided into so-called strips, uh, and your strips were scattered across the open field. So imagine if you had a field that was a square, and you paced off uh, along one border of that field, you paste off six feet, you put a marker. You pace off another six feet, you put another marker, and so forth, until you've marked uh, the entire field uh, at six foot intervals. And then you say, the first six foot strip of this field belongs to farmer A, the second to farmer B, and so forth. So you all work together to farm that big field, and then you <coughs> each have a claim to the crops from every 10th or 12th or 14th uh, strip. Uh, this kind of communal agriculture has some upsides. It means that if in a, you know, a kind of act of God type situation where a flood destroys half of the field, because your strips are scattered, it means everybody loses half their crop, but everybody still has half of the, uh, half of the usual uh, income from the field. Uh, imagine uh, in a different scenario where you have free persons, free persons have land enclosed, uh, much like we do today. And so if you're a freeman and your lands are down near the river uh, and the river floods just that part of the manor, you could lose everything in one go. And so there, it's higher risk to farm independently when you're a free tenant, but at the same time, uh, there's potentially much higher reward because the work you put in as an individual uh, might well be reflected in uh, exceptional personal gain or better harvest. If you're a freeman farming just your lands, you may choose to work extra hours, for example, to fertilize those lands with manure. Now, from the late 1100s, people clear uh, for planting a lot of new land, and the term for clearing uh, 
clearing new lands for farming is to assart lands. You'll see it here in quotation marks. When you assart lands, you, you move away the boulders, you pull out the, the trees and scrub, and then you get a plow in there and till it up so it's ready to plant. Now, newly assorted lands are farmed individually and held by leasehold or even free tenure. Freemen and bondmen both assert new land to relieve hunger and make profit. So what you see is when the population trebles between 1066 and 1300, <coughs> people start looking for extra land to farm to make sure that there's enough food to go around come wintertime. And so what they do is they go out to the edges of the, of the manor and they begin to clear scrubland. But when they do that, people want to be rewarded for their individual effort in clearing new lands. And so uh, the Lord of the Manor tends to recognize uh, in a particular assart or a particular bit of new, newly cleared land as belonging to one specific family, even if that family is bond. <coughs> so I want to say a bit more about the, the second aspect uh, of society in this period. I've kind of segued into it there a little bit by mentioning uh, the desire of individual families or individuals for their family to be recognized as being in possession of newly cleared lands. Now family and kinship are very important. Uh, land in many places tends to be most often bought and sold uh, between relatives and we tend to think also in terms of natural buyers and natural sellers in the Middle Ages. Now that is to say, uh, because most of the labor on your family farm is provided uh, by members of your family as opposed to hired hands, it means that when you have lots of children and your family is getting bigger, you have the labor capacity to farm more land and so you become a natural buyer who's out looking for top-up land uh, to purchase and add to your farm. At the same time, uh, if you have inherited land from your uh, parents' generation, but you have a lot fewer children than your parents had, you might say, look, I don't have the labor power to farm all of this land, uh, but I would have to pay taxes on all of it no matter what. Therefore, we need to offload some of this excess property and a small family uh, becomes a family of uh, a natural seller, as we say. So natural buyers are those with a, a growing family who need more land. Natural sellers, those with a shrinking family uh, that need less land. Often, but not in all of England, the eldest son tends to inherit everything. Uh, households are most often comprised of about four to six persons, that's say a mother, a father, and two to four children, typically. Uh, and so the labor that can be uh, invested in property by a maximum of maybe five or six persons tends to be reflected in the uh, size of farms where there's lots of land available. Of course, where when population creeps up towards its maximum size around about 1300, what you see is families comprised maybe of six or even seven or eight persons living on farms that clearly uh, don't reach that 12 or 14 acre threshold to feed even four. Now again, there's lots of variability here. In lowland areas, uh, because many families don't have a land, enough land to support themselves, uh, what you'll find is that one or two people from the household will go out and work occasionally. Uh, larger and wealthier families uh, often have household servants, about 20% of them do. And so what you find is a, a poor family that doesn't have much land uh, might send off a couple of their children at, at ages, say, 8 to 12, <coughs> to go be live-in household servants on a larger farm. So there we see a sort of redistribution of population to mirror the uh, labor needs of farms of different sizes. Foster children are a very common part of family units. Fosterage is particularly important in Celtic areas where landed men often made their bond tenants foster their children. This might sound a little strange, but it also creates uh, a ties of uh, tolerance from top down 
Uh, so a, a, a rich landowner who himself as a child was fostered by a Bond family maybe is a bit more sympathetic towards uh, Bond families. On the other hand, uh, if a bond, prominent Bond family in a village f raises as a foster child uh, one of the children of the rich family or own the manor, uh, they might feel that they have a personal connection with that, that person and be less likely to rebel against uh, calls for taxation or the attempted collection of fines by that uh, rich landowning family. Also, of course, at a time of high mortality, uh, it's very common for children to end up uh, orphaned, and so fostering uh, children is quite uh, common for that reason as well. When we think about marriage and household formation, the church did not allow marriage among family up to second cousins. And you might ask yourself, do, do you know who all of your second cousins are? Now, this includes your uh, godparents and their relations as well. So uh, typically in the Middle Ages when you were baptized, uh, godparents were designated, both a godfather and a godmother, probably a, a friend of the family. So not only could you later in life not marry your own relatives out to second cousins, but you could also not marry any of the relatives of your through your god uh, father and mother out to their sec, out to their uh, cousins. Now this is means that in a small village it's often hard to find someone to marry who's not within the kind of prohibited groups. Uh, and so some places, for example, uh, in the Pyrenees and the border between uh, France and Spain, a study was done years ago and, and determined that you know, something around a quarter of all people who got married had to go seek a special dispensation from the parish priest to allow them to marry somebody within the prescribed degrees. Now, when do you get married? Well, uh, most men tend to marry in their early 20s and, and women likewise. Uh, but the women tend to be a couple of years younger than the men, typically. And they tend to move away, uh, particularly in the later Middle Ages, they tend to move away from home and form a new household. And I'll talk about this at a later point, but what you find is it's more likely for grandparents uh, through grandchildren to live in the same household in the 1200s uh, than in the late 1300s. Certainly by the late 13, early 1400s, uh, the focus... <coughs> is on uh, nuclear family uh, or nuclear household formation. In Upland, Wales and Ireland, uh, we have overwhelmingly free societies with a very high proportion of free uh, persons. And if you were in Upland, Wales or Ireland and you're a free person, then you consider yourself uh, to be noble by default. And this is a real a cultural difference because in England, quote unquote, nobles are, are a very small cadre of persons who are in a, at least some vague way uh, related to the, the king uh, and his associates. Uh, and you have a lot of people in England who are just, you know, free persons who've managed over the centuries, their families have managed to avoid uh, being trapped into that coercive relationship with the local lord. Now, Wales and Ireland... Uh, because of their uh, great social uh, concern for lineage, consider themselves over generations to be noble so long as they're not stained with unfreedom. Kinship networks have special legal implications as well. Uh, in upland areas, uh, property might be held in common among extended families. So, uh, in a Welsh context, that would be the gwely, which is a, a grouping comprised, you know, of course, that word means bed in English, of course, or lactus in Latin. That's a grouping of all persons with the same great grandfather. And they tend to uh, occupy a large area, say an entire uh, part, upper river valley, say, and move herds of cattle around that large area. In theory, all persons. Uh, have equal shares, or all adult men have equal shares in that uh, er property, in that area. And sons uh, see things divided equally. So if you imagine every household, say, has a 
a claim to a share of the Gwelis lands. Uh, if that household had associated with it a dozen cows and there are three sons, each son would get four cows. You know, everything's divided quite equally. That's in contrast to, as I mentioned before, the typical English custom of primogeniture by which everything goes to the oldest son. Another difference here, uh, under uh, English law, if there are no sons, daughters can inherit. Under Celtic, Welsh, or Irish law, women may never own property under any circumstances. Under Celtic law, uh, when there's a criminal offence, say a murder or an assault, uh, these are punished through compensation. So the, offenders fa the offender and his or her family pay compensation to the victim uh, and his or her family. And the compensation payment is collected from the entire group sharing the same grandfather, excuse me, sharing the same great grandfather on the offender side and it's paid out to the entire group sharing the same great grandfather on the victim side. Now one result of this is a heightened sense of importance placed on kinship uh, and knowing just who your kin are in Celtic areas. Imagine, so you share uh, a, you share a great-grandfather with everyone out to and including your second cousins. Imagine if A, you know who all your second cousins are, and B, you lived constantly with the risk that if one of your second cousins did something extraordinarily stupid, resulting in a large criminal f fine, you would have to help pay it. A bit about diet and lifespan here. In lowland areas, uh, <coughs> people focus uh, overwhelmingly on producing uh, and indeed on eating uh, grain and leavened bread or uh, pottage. Pottage in Middle Ages is basically porridge as we know it today. It's grain soaked in warm water uh, until it's soft enough to eat. Uh, of secondary importance in lowland areas uh, is dairy, milk, cheese and butter. And uh, of tertiary importance uh, is meat or fish. Uh, meat tends to be eaten on very rare occasions because you have to slaughter an animal, uh, which is typically one of your most viable possessions, and it produces a lot of food which has to be consumed very quickly uh, when you don't have refrigeration. Fish is a little more commonly eaten because Christians believed that on Fridays you shouldn't eat uh, any meat, uh, and so if you are wealthy enough to typically eat meat, keep in mind that puts you in a small group, uh, that you will forgo meat in uh, exchange for fish on a Friday. Now in upland areas, especially Wales, Scotland and Ireland, uh, this is reversed largely. Uh, dairy, milk, cheese and butter will be your main uh, source of food. A pottage and unleavened bread uh, will be your secondary source of food and again uh, tertiary will be regular access to small amounts of meat. If you're in an upland society where you uh, mostly rear cattle, sheep or cattle, uh, you will eat more more than a lowland, eat meat more than a lowland society. Now infant mortality is very high uh, but if you reached your teens you'd probably survive into your 40s or 50s. So you've made it to adulthood, you understand your tenure, you, you think you have a, a sense of the world around you and you want to see more. How do you interact with the wider world? Well, first you interact through money and markets. Rural families are never entirely self-sufficient. Now there's some debate about this. Uh, I'd encourage you to look at the works of Christopher Dyer on uh, making a living in the Middle Ages. That's a, um, perhaps his most important book. Um, but generally speaking, there's a sense that even the poorest of peasants need access uh, to the market by the later Middle Ages. Markets are, take the form either of annual uh, rural fairs or markets uh, or a weekly borough market. And these are your two main options in the Middle Ages. A, a fair which might run for a week in the spring or perhaps a week in the spring and a week in the autumn. Uh, or uh, trundling off to a small town uh, where you could 
uh, visit a, a, more a market with a more limited range of goods uh, once a week. Once you get there, peasants typically exchange agricultural surpluses for coins. Uh, they then use those coins uh, increasingly from the late 1200s. Uh, they use coins to pay their taxes. They can also use coins to buy so-called durable goods that they can't make for themselves, such as shoes, metal goods, uh, cloth, etc. Um, the kinds of metal goods they'd need would be uh, both things such as, uh, for example, a frying pan. <coughs> uh, one good frying pan as a central and valuable item in a, a medieval household inventory is not unusual. But you also need bits of metal uh, to help with harness work, uh, for belt buckles, uh, to give to your village blacksmith, to make bits for your plow and so forth. Now, commercialization grows rapidly in step with the uh, trebling of population. And there's a big debate whether it's growing population that leads to commercialization, or is it the other way around? Is it commercialization, i.e. the creation of markets that make it easier to get hold of these little things you need, like shoes or metal goods and so forth, that spurs on population growth? Uh, it's hard to tell which which way around it is. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg question. Between 1098 and 1483, the crown uh, made 2,800 grants of new markets. Around 1,400 of these grants were made in the period 1200 to 1275. So that's a period of really intensifying uh, commercialization uh, and indeed urbanization. A lot of new towns are founded in the uh, 13th century as well. In fact, in Wales, I'll come back to this in a, a later lecture, but in Wales around 1200, uh, there were probably only a dozen or so towns. But by 1300, there are uh, almost exactly 105 uh, chartered towns in Wales. So it's an incredible transformation. Uh, in Wales, uh, less than 2% of people lived in a town around about, 13, excuse me, around about 1200. But by 1300, 100 years later, about one in five persons in Wales lived in a town. So there, there's a real uh, commercial transformation happening in England uh, and uh, indeed England's neighbors. Two important aspects uh, of social change happen alongside this. The first is commutation. Uh, the word commutation uh, means allowing peasants to pay uh, traditional dues and renders with money. So, for example, if for the last 200 years your farm has owed a uh, tax of three bushels of grain and two chickens to the Lord, what will happen around about 1200 is the Lord will come out and say, I reckon that that grain and those chickens have a value of eight pence. Therefore, you keep the grain and the chickens and you give me eight, eight silver pennies. But of course, that can only happen at a time uh, in a place where it's possible for the peasant to carry his grain and chickens off to a marketplace and sell them in exchange for the pennies that the Lord wants to have as tax revenue. And of course, the, the use of coins just lubricates the economy. It's so much easier for the Lord who collects taxes in coins to do things like pay masons and workers to build a castle than it is for him to deal with tons of grain and chickens that have been paid in taxes and find a way to convert those into wages for his workers. Now, the, the church is a, a really important conduit for news entering the community uh, and indeed for news of things happening there to be taken other places. A, a, a parish church structure is fully developed in the British Isles around about 1300. This means that free and unfree tenants alike uh, could on any given Sunday walk uh, to a parish church. If you imagine that a person could only walk a few miles in a day, that means that you have an incredible investment in infrastructure to build uh, a parish church for everyone. Now that's paid for in a variety of ways, but a key way is the collection of tithes or an ecclesiastical tax of one-tenth of one's produce given to the church each year. And this is mandatory, it's not voluntary.
This supports the parish priest who works there. It also supports the, the construction and maintenance of the fabric of the church. In conjunction with the creation of this network of parish churches, Pope Innocent III in 1213 demands every person to thereafter attend church and make confession at least once a year. Baptism, last rites, and burial in consecrated ground are also uh, growing in importance, considered really to be essential by the late 1200s. Uh, and so you, you as a, a peasant feel you need that parish church there so you have a suitable place to be buried so that your soul may get to heaven. As I said, the parish church is a conduit for news entering and exiting the community, both secular news and ecclesiastical news. If a king announces a war and he wants that information to reach the people, uh, he will request that it be, for example, nailed on the doors of parish churches uh, and for the masses who tend to be illiterate to be announced by the parish priest in church. Trade, socializing and uh, various agreements often are made at the church uh, itself. If everybody's known to be in the same place at the same time on a Sunday, where better to, to meet your neighbor to strike a bargain over the exchange of some cattle or land, for instance. The church from 1100, well, excuse me, from about 1300, holds ecclesiastical courts where you can be tried or punished for what, what are known as breaches of faith. These, in effect, are uh, commissions of sins such as adultery and so forth. Punishments range from penance to excommunication. And at a time when people felt that their soul could only get to heaven if they were uh, within uh, the embrace of the church and properly buried, then excommunication is a big deal. Also, when you excommunicate, uh, other people in the community typically won't communicate with you uh, and will not uh, engage in trade with you. So it's, it's a really big deal. The crown and the king itself uh, also is another avenue by which you, you got to know the wider world. The crown regularly levied, levied uh, what are called subsidies to pay for warfare, uh, for example, against Wales, Scotland or France. A subsidy is a tax reckoned as a percent of the value of your movable goods. That is to say, leaving aside your land, let's add up the value of everything you own, your animals, uh, everything in your cupboards, your clothing, and so forth, and then you will pay a percentage of that value in tax. For example, uh, if you have a lay subsidy of a tenth, then they add up the value of all of your goods, uh, divide that by ten, and that's the amount you have to pay in tax. So you know that a tax is being levied for a particular purpose, and that makes you aware of what's happening in the wider world. Uh, Subsidies could be either lay or clerical. That is to say, uh, they could be collected on the same basis of calculation. Uh, they could be reckoned against ordinary uh, uh, persons who are not members of religious orders or priests. Or on the other hand, you could uh, target specifically the church and priests uh, for the collection of a so-called clerical subsidy. Men are often recruited as well as paid soldiers uh, for lords uh, or for the crown. This is very common. Uh, at one point, about 10,000 people are recruited from Wales just after the conquest to go fight in Scotland. Uh, that comprises a, you know, a significant percentage uh, of all of the adult male people in Wales. If you think if Wales is a total population of, say, 200,000, uh, if only 100,000 of them are men and only 50,000 uh, are of fighting age, then when you recruit 10,000 men from Wales to go fight in Scotland, uh, that's something like 20% of all uh, adult males of fighting age in Wales. It's a, big, uh, it's a big draw. And men as soldiers, of course, travel with the Crown Scotland, to Scotland, Wales, Ireland, uh, France, Spain, other places throughout uh, the later Middle Ages. And those people return home with stories about the outside world, perhaps inspiring others to go join the army and travel. Uh, it's an important way by which people see the world. There's a notion that medieval people lived and died within the site of the same church uh, in which they were baptized. Uh, that's uh, an idea that came about in a, 
early 20th century literature, but it's been slowly uh, uh, eroded over the years. Yeah, a lot of people did spend most of their life in that village near to their parish church. But, and it's a big but, a majority of people, uh, excuse me, uh, while a majority of people did stay in the village, a substantial minority did leave for either for trade or for warfare. And it doesn't require everyone to leave the village for people back home to know what's going on in the wider world. It only ever takes a few people uh, to go out, uh, see what's going on, come back and transmit that knowledge, which then moves about as rumor. Colonization is another key way by which people saw the world. And we'll have a lecture later, of course, on migration and mobility in the Middle Ages. But for now, it's sufficient to say that the movement of people, particularly from England into Wales and Ireland, is of profound importance. By the year 1300, as many as one in five people living in, in Wales uh, was a first, second or third generation immigrant from England. People are moving out of England uh, due to the high population density there, the difficulty of getting land and the fear of starvation. Now, the status of people when they arrive in Wales uh, is highly dependent upon when they came. When the English first begin to colonize Wales uh, in the 1100s, they round up bond people and make them move to Wales. And so, for example, Gwent in the southeast, uh, which saw lots of settlers come from uh, Herefordshire, came to contain quite a lot of bondmen. But as, the, as time goes on, as we creep up uh, to the latter half of the 13th century, it tends to be that English uh, people chose to move to Wales and indeed to Ireland to try and escape bond tenure back in England. Also, if you if you struggle to have to uh, get hold of enough land to feed your family back in England, uh, you will do what it takes to survive, which for a lot of people was to pick up and move to Wales or Ireland. Uh, and a lot of offers were made by conquering English lords of Wales in the late 1200s to try and induce Englishmen to come and settle there. In Denbyshire, for example, they were offered uh, lots of land, cheap rents free tenure, and so forth. The nature of colonization was ultimately to divide the landscape. A largely free upland indigenous society uh, carried on in existence while lowland areas uh, tended to be densely colonized by incoming English. So low, persons in lowland uh, Ireland and Wales were either integrated into the uh, incoming English immigrant community or they were as often as not displaced up into upland areas. Now this matters quite a bit because if you've spent generations uh, farming the sort of fertile uh, coastal plain of Glamorgan and then suddenly you're displaced uh, up into the Brecon Beacons uh, based on the brash English assumption that because there are some cattle herding Welsh persons getting by up there, you'll make it, uh, then you're really going to suffer because you don't know a darn thing about rearing cattle and you have none to start with. So this could be really disruptive. Uh, the creation of towns in Wales uh, and indeed in Ireland uh, again has an important uh, role to play here because they're kind of nodes of incoming English immigration and most of the early townspeople of Wales and Ireland tend to be English immigrants. Thank you.